Hi, everybody. I uh, recently got back to Colorado, and uh, I'm going to be here for a little bit. And sometimes I look through the Reddits, and I find some interesting threads, and um, occasionally they encourage me to make a statement or say something. And uh, I came across a thread that was a bit critical of the entire peer review process. And the article, uh, the, the thread, cited several uh, different issues with the overall peer review process, in particular in the American academic system. For example, the grievance studies affair, uh, and then some issues with some Israeli research, you know, making some claims about medicine, and perhaps they weren't true. And so I, what I wanted to do was make a video, because I, I see this as a common thread throughout the cryptocurrency space, this uh, questioning, a constant questioning of why is peer review necessary, or does peer review actually produce good results, or uh, are scientists just all biased and they all have agendas and uh, you apparently just say whatever you want, get it published, and uh, it's not a legitimate way of resolving debate. So it's incredibly important first to separate social studies, grievance studies, uh, the liberal arts from the STEM fields. If you look at the, the social studies, the liberal arts, uh, th these fields, uh, what we've noticed over the last 50 years in particular has been a degradation of rigor and a replacement of opinion as if it's fact. And uh, the Grievance Studies Affair and uh, uh, numerous other examples have, have really shown that it's not okay to be able to take Mein Kampf and replace Jews with white men and suddenly that's publishable because certain circles politically think that's fine. Uh, and in a way, this has badly damaged, in my view, in the view of many people, the integrity of the overall university system and uh, academic affairs. And that's certainly a concern. And it's a big topic, and it's, it's something that uh, we as a society have to work our way through. And I would agree that um, if you've replaced the scientific method, rigor, critical thinking with just a political agenda and just... A subjective opinion, whatever happens to be the latest buzzword, if you use that, you're published, and if you don't, well, you're excommunicated, uh, or if there are forbidden topics to talk about, uh, like uh, intelligence studies or other things, uh, that's certainly an issue. But when you look at the STEM fields, particularly mathematics, computer science, physics, these fields, uh, their integrity is mostly intact. Uh, and for the most part, if you're arguing around a particular topic, like if something provably secure, uh, is, is this mathematical proof correct? This has not been in any way compromised by uh, a political agenda. I don't even know what the political agenda would be if a particular block cipher is right or wrong. You know, is this, there's no such thing as a cisgender or transgender symmetric crypto scheme. It's, it's a statement of this is your adversary, this is your mathematical model, uh, this, is, this is the rationale behind uh, why it's uh, secure. And it's an argument. It's a mathematical proof. It's something that anyone, regardless of their language, their culture, their, their socioeconomic status, they can be anywhere in the world, can read that and either say you're right or you're wrong. And if you're wrong, provide a counterexample or s provide some sort of hole in the way that the proof was constructed. And you also have to understand that research is only as good as the process upon which the research is analyzed. So if you look at cryptography in particular, this is an incredibly fertile, rich field that is very adversarial. When you publish a paper, it always, regardless of who you are, is instantly viewed with some degree of skepticism. And there are many people who have made careers out of doing nothing but trying to find ways to rip apart your papers. And the whole point of the process that cryptographers have created with conferences and adversarial peer review and uh, a very fast paced system, and the fact that governments, militaries, intelligence agencies rely upon the outputs of this process to secure classified information, military secrets, uh, nation secrets, has created a fertile environment where bad ideas are usually meticulously and mercilessly picked apart very rapidly. 
So when you look at the grand scheme of things, you, you, you look at grand security claims. Intel SGX is, is a great example of this, where it has a lot of merit, and in some cases, trusted hardware is magical. But then scientists can make a career doing nothing but finding holes in that scheme. When I was at CCS in Toronto, uh, right after we uh, presented Ouroboros Genesis, uh, just down the hall, there was a group of scientists who they've published several papers showing where Intel's claims about security are wrong. And they're making their careers, basically forcing Intel to own up to the fact that maybe their system isn't as good as it should be. The other thing is that unlike journals, which take sometimes years for research to actually end up getting published, fully peer reviewed and get through the system, conferences are very frequent. If you look at the cryptographic world, you have Eurocrypt, CCS, real world crypto, financial crypto, uh, and dozens of other conferences every year. Almost every month, there's some form of conference that's going on. So it really doesn't slow you down to write a paper in a very structured, thoughtful way get it into a conference, and then get some review from the community. And all of a sudden, now you have some of the brightest people in the world waking up, trying to find a way to destroy your argument because they know that it benefits their academic career if they can find a flaw in your paper. Furthermore, marrying formal methods with peer review basically forces the scientists to be honest because what happens is you extract a specification from the paper and all these hand waving areas of the paper where they say, well, uh, you know, ideal functionality, just assume the network works perfectly and there's no latency and a blockchain can instantly be transported anywhere in the world to any user, regardless of their internet connection. The formal methods guy says, well, that's a great fantasy, but if we're actually going to build this and implement this, and I'm going to write a specification for this, we actually have to be very specific about what you mean when you say you can do X or Y. And then when the engineer gets involved, the engineer can further force practicality out of these schemes. So if you utilize formal methods in peer review, you're not guaranteed to get a perfect secure system. But what you are guaranteed to get is an adversarial system where people have a reputational and career benefit of finding a flaw in your ideas. And you have somebody just as smart as the scientist who's in a different field of computer science, using very sophisticated techniques, in some cases computer-aided techniques, like model checking and other such things, to try to tease out whether these ideas are actually practical or actually work. And you can do all of these things in weeks to months, not years to decades. That's the magic of building a good streamlined process. And what does it mean? It means by the time we get to implementing the actual protocol, it's already been rigorously, rigorously debated and argued, and people have great incentives to say that what we have done is wrong. So it's not just a spray and pray. It's not just a release and say, well, let's see if some guy or gal somewhere in the world can now figure out if the system is broken or not. That's perfectly fine in the open source ethos when it's BitTorrent, when it's open office, when the consequences of a bug or a poor design means that you have suboptimal product, it crashes, it may have a security flaw, maybe Bobby's uh, essay gets stolen or corrupted. But when you're talking about a world financial system that will eventually have billions to trillions of dollars of value behind it, why the hell wouldn't you want some third party assurance from people who aren't shills, people who have no financial incentive to say it's good, that it's good? Why wouldn't you want to utilize a 400 plus year old system that's given us modern day physics, modern day mathematics, modern day medicine, modern day computers, and all the things we take for granted, these LCDs, semiconductors, all these things. Why wouldn't you want the same process that trained the minds that built these things and kept the minds that built these things accountable to be applied to your money system? Especially if the trade-off is it slows you down by a factor of several months. Not years, but several months. So I, I take great umbrage when I see Reddit threads or I see people attempt to overgeneralize and say because of the grievance studies affair or because somebody decides that they want to abandon logic in their particular discipline of study, that somehow computer science has been corrupted. 
the system that this field uses is fundamentally good. It works very well, it's very fast, it's very responsive, and it allows you to go from lab to industry quickly. Why? Because the primary subsidy for this system comes from industry. Microsoft, IBM, Apple, Google, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA are massive proprietors. They're benefactors. They give money to the research arms. And if you look at many of the papers in computer science, they come from scientists who are in and out of industry all the time. One of the big pioneers of AI is Andrew Ning. And another one's Peter Norvig. Another Sebastian Thruen. And these guys wrote all the textbooks. They, they've done amazing research in AI. And they just so happen to be working on things like self-driving cars and Coursera and Udacity and the Google translation system. So that while they're doing scientific research, they're building production systems, consumer products that we use every single day. This is because the field of computer science is set up and built from the ground up to be able to facilitate that seamless movement between the needs of industry and maintaining scientific rigor. So at IOHK, what we've done is we've tried to be very pragmatic. You can go crazy with formal methods. The SEL4 project and CompCert and other projects are great examples of that. There are major milestones, wonderful research, but they took years to decades to get done. That would not make Cardano or any product IOHK competitive if we went down that road. But using things like TLA, using things like COC, using things like just running a LaTeX spec in, uh, and getting the mathematics down, this does not take years. This takes weeks to months. And then we now have an ambiguity-free, mathematically precise way to talk about what the hell are we doing. If you look at recent bugs, like for example, Coindesk had an article about a flaw in Zcash. The Zcash team I know personally. We sometimes publish papers with the Zcash team. These people are wonderful professionals. They're great engineers. They have phenomenal processes and they have great standards. And I would count them among the top five development teams in all of cryptocurrency. Despite the fact that they have that talent and those capabilities, there was a bug that if exploited would have allowed the infinite production of money in that system, effectively making the entire cryptocurrency useless especially given the fact it's hard to know who owns what. Now, the use of formal methods actually allows you to catch these types of bugs, allows you to discover these types of things, not after they've happened, not after you've shipped the code to customers, but before you ship code to customers. So this is why you use formal methods. Zcash is based on peer-reviewed research, and it's only one of the core reasons I think a lot of people trust it and trust the anonymity guarantees because the fact that great scientists got together and thought very carefully about this, and they're using very complicated cryptographic primitives that normal engineers, normal people really don't understand. So in defense of peer review, I think that what we need to do is take a step back and think about things very rationally. And we have to ask, what are the incentives for people to say you're right? What are the incentives for people to try to find a way to prove you wrong? You have a very good productive system when people have brand, reputational, career, or financial incentives to try to find a way to prove the work you're doing is broken. And if they can only do that through a structured process where they have to be honest, they're not shilling, they're not writing papers and just making things up, but they actually have to provide a counter argument, a counter example. They have to actually demonstrate where in the proof you're wrong then that's the best of both worlds because in the process of rebutting you and destroying your argument, they actually teach you something and you're having a constructive, productive dialogue. So I, I think that this is frankly the standard our industry as a whole has to embrace. Ethereum agrees with us. They've given $5 million with others to Stanford and set up a lab and they're starting to move in the peer review direction. Algorand is doing the same thing. Unit E is doing the same thing. Zcash is writing papers. Many other people are writing papers. So this is not an IOHK thing anymore. This is quickly becoming an industry standard. And all of you, everyone, you really have to think carefully. If a person is making a claim, you have to train yourself to ask a question, well, has that claim been vetted? If so, by whom? What incentives did that person uh, or organization have? To either agree or disagree with the claim? And by what process have we established trust that that claim is credible? 
The only way I know how to vet scientific research is by utilizing what science has done for 400 years. I fully admit and accept the university is not a perfect ecosystem. I fully accept and admit that it has some real big problems, especially on the social sciences and the liberal arts area, and it's losing credibility there. But that is not our problem in our space, in our field. Computer science is led by industry and the science is sculpted by industry. So it means it has to be done quickly. It has to be done with a product orientation and it has to be done in an objective way. Because at the end of the day, the free market doesn't care what gender you are, doesn't care what your political values are, your, or your personal philosophy or whatever grievances you may have had a hundred years ago. Free market cares, does it work? Does it work well? And is it the best, most efficient way of solving this particular problem? And can we distribute it? Can we get it out there? Is it easy to do? So when you have free market competitive nature behind things, the research you do, the science you do has to work and it has to be pure. And when the military has to get it right, when the intelligence agencies has to get it right, then that really means you have to have a good effective system. So uh, it's a brief video, but I just wanted to, to really rebut this, this claim that somehow uh, because one part of the system is not working, the whole system should be thrown away. I really do believe the processes we're following are necessary. They're not sufficient. You have to do more. You have to have formal methods. You have to give it time. You have to build the systems. And it doesn't matter if you have peer review done. That doesn't promise you that it's competitive, it's practical, or it's going to work for the problems your customer have. So the ultimate test of any product you build is shipping that product to the customer, to the marketplace, and seeing what the marketplace does over the long run. Not in the short term, because you can ship trash and trash can win in the short term, but over the long term, a three to five year to 10 year horizon, the market will inevitably tell you if these ideas are meaningful. Uh, so uh, that's basically it. Um, and I, I really, I just, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, these processes exist for a reason, these people exist for a reason, uh, and this is your money. And at the end of the day, if we end up being pulled into this industry and cryptocurrencies work, these protocols will be used for years to decades to centuries. And if they're misdesigned, the poor decisions that I make and other designers make, you're going to have to live with for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, your kids, your grandchildren may have to live. Just like we have to live with the poor decisions that governments made in the past. Whatever at Bretton Woods was decided, whatever at the World Economic Forum was decided 30 years ago, that is now impacting the markets, the banks, your, your cash in your pocket today, the national debt of the United States or wherever you happen to live, the good decisions, the bad decisions you have to live with. So my core argument is we have a moral obligation to use the best tools, the best techniques, and the best processes possible to ensure that the system we construct ends up being used wisely, responsibly, and securely and fairly as we move into the 21st century. At our company, the only way we know how to do this is to marry good engineering, peer review, and formal methods together as a bundled process and get a customer-oriented culture where we get the product out in front of people as quickly as possible, even if that means sometimes it's not an optimal product. It's a little slow or crashes or it doesn't have the right performance. When you go through the process of peer review and third-party security auditing and formal methods, you can at least guarantee things can't happen, like people can't lose their money or there aren't going to be foundational problems in the protocol which can be exploited to create coins out of thin air or other such things. Uh, and then you have to just work hard to make the product better and more competitive and have a better user experience. So anyway, that's, uh, that's that. So thank you guys for your time and uh, talk to you again later.